Good morning. Happy New Year's to everybody. Uh, today's scripture is from Luke 2, uh, verses 22 through 40. Better get these glasses on first, though. When the time came for Mary's purification offering at the temple, as required by the laws of Moses after the birth of a child, his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. For in these laws, God had said, if a woman's first child is a boy, he shall be dedicated to the Lord. At that time, Jesus' parents also offered their sacrifice for purification. Either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons was the legal requirement. That day, a man named Simeon, a Jerusalem resident, was in the temple. He was a very good man, devout, filled with the Holy Spirit, and constantly expecting the Messiah to come soon. For the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen him, God's anointed king. The Holy Spirit had impelled him to go to the temple that day, and so when Mary and Joseph arrived to present the baby Jesus to the Lord in obedience to the law, Simeon was there and took the child in his arms, praising God. Lord, he said, now I can die content, for I have seen him as you promised me I would. I have seen the Savior you have given to the world. He is the light that will shine upon the nations, and he will be the glory of your people Israel. Joseph and Mary just stood there marveling at what was being said about Jesus. Simeon blessed them, but then said to Mary, A sword shall pierce your soul, for this child shall be rejected by many in Israel, and this to their undoing. But he will be the greatest joy of many others, and the deepest thoughts of many hearts shall be revealed. Anna, a prophetess, was also there in the temple that day. She was the daughter of Phanuel, of the Jewish tribe of Asher, and was very old, for she had been a widow for 84 years, following seven years of marriage. She never left the temple, but stayed there night and day, worshiping God by praying and often fasting. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she also began thanking God and telling everyone in Jerusalem who had been awaiting the coming of the Savior that the Messiah had finally arrived. When Jesus' parents, Jesus' parents, had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of God, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child became a strong, robust lad and was known for wisdom beyond his years, and God poured out his blessings on him. The word of God for the people of God. A special thank you to Margaret for leading us in music this morning and offering Susie a chance for a little R&R after the busy holiday season. Who in your faith life do you really trust? Like, really, really trust. You know that they are faithful, they listen to God, they are prayerful, and they genuinely hear from the Holy Spirit. They're not in the, they sound crazy, but they could be faithful category. They're in the genuinely faithful category. And their faith extends beyond the basics, such that if you had a new experience in faith, you could go to them and see if you're crazy or if you experienced God. Who is that person for you? Maybe you know someone personally, or maybe they're a friend of a friend, or maybe you're waiting to see if those people actually exist. I'd say that I have two of those people in my life that I go to semi-regularly. Just two. It's not that many. There are many others who I know are faithful, who I go to for prayer, who offer godly wisdom and reflection. I go to them for lots of spiritual things. But passing the litmus test of faith experiences that move beyond the everyday to teach and lead and guide me into new territories, there's only a couple 
And it has taken years of building relationship with them, of asking them for prayer and for wisdom and seeing how God worked through them for me to know how and when to call on their gifts. One is Pastor Greg. He's from Mississippi, but has served in California on and off over the years, which is where I met him. He and I did camping ministry together. He focuses a lot on prayer and healing ministry. And after a couple years of working together, he started teaching me about the charismatic side of faith. Now, I grew up a good United Methodist which means I knew nothing about the charismatic side of faith. A Western Methodist, a California Methodist. Southerners know a little bit something different, but as a California Methodist, I did not. So Greg was gentle, and he didn't try and push it. It was only when I had questions. But I found over the years that God often gives Greg holy insight into a situation, offering him an image when he prays. And then he offers me that image, and it often tells me a bit about the situation as well as maybe what I should do next. The other is Betty. She came to one of my churches, and before she even visited us, she called to vet us. And she asked about our willingness to listen to and respond to the Holy Spirit. She wanted a Spirit-led church. She has the gifts of both intercession and the gift of knowledge. Betty has prayed for me and for us many a time, and she's given me two strong words over the years. Now, if you're raised traditional or you're new to the church, a word is not a single individual word. It's more of sort of a holy message, a divine insight. It might be a word from scripture, a passage, or a verse. It might be a word of song, or it might be just a word that God has given them, a phrase, um, sometimes a little bit more. She's offered me two in the 12, 13 years that I've known her, right? They're not all the time. It's not every other week. They're few and far between. The first came in January of 2015. It had been about 18 months since I had miscarried our second pregnancy, and we were praying and trying for another baby, and seemingly our prayers were falling on deaf ears. If you've ever been a hopeful couple, 18 months is an eternity, And I simply asked Betty to pray. I was despondent and not sure that we would ever have another child. And when I texted Betty to ask her to pray, she immediately said, call me. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. So I called her, and she had a handful of sentences that God had given her uh, in prayer to tell me, including that God would answer my prayer like God had answered Hannah's. Now, those of you that need a little refresher on Old Testament, Hannah is the woman who was barren, unable to conceive, and ultimately God answered her prayer, whom she named Samuel with her son, and she dedicated him to the Lord. A little after two months of talking, two months after talking with Betty that time, I became pregnant with Stephen. That might not sound like much to some of you, I was a woman in her early 30s, and lots of folks could have guessed or assumed that I'd get pregnant in time, but my relationship with Betty and my knowledge of her prayer life helped me to trust that she was really listening to the voice of God. And I can also share that I've had my fair share of wackadoos, Uh, one in particular who came to me when I was barely pregnant with Ruth, not knowing anything. I was still maybe in the second month right? I didn't know the gender. We didn't have any details. And that man came to me, said he'd use the Bible code, which is a conspiracy all of its own, uh, and said I was going to have a son and we would name him John Allen. And in the same work, he told me that there would be an 8.0 earthquake in California on December 22nd. It would cause a tsunami that would reach 90 miles inland where we were, and that we needed to go to this specific steel company to have the sanctuary reinforced or it would all go down in the storm. His prophecy did not come true in our lives in any way, shape, or form. There is some discernment involved in learning to trust these folks. 
The second time that he offered a word of knowledge or spoke prophetically into our lives came during a challenging time. There was a lot that was stirred up, and I had simply asked her to pray for us. I hadn't given her the details. She didn't know who or what specifically was going on. I just asked her to pray. And again, after I texted her, within 20 or 30 minutes, she said, call me. Yes, ma'am. And she said, get a pen and paper. You're going to want to write this down. There's a lot. She gave me 12 points that God had given her, specific to our situation with language that was unique to what we were considering and praying about, but that I had never offered her. She said, do this, don't do that, wait for this, do that. God says this, God says that. She was very pointed and clear, and I knew that I could trust her. I hadn't spilled my gut. She wasn't simply offering reflection or wisdom. God had given her some kind of insight for me to trust. That's a long way of getting to today's text. As I think about Simeon and Anna, I think about Greg and Betty. Both were faithful and trusted, not just to one or two people, but to many. Think about what you heard today. We aren't reading their memoirs. We aren't reading their account of what happened when they saw the baby Jesus. We are reading the account that was shared by others for years one of the only stories of Jesus' childhood to be thought worthy of including in his life story. It had to be a powerful moment and also considered reliable. Jesus met a lot of people in his life, and not all of them were trusted. Their stories could have been and sometimes were easily dismissed. Yet these two were talking about someone who couldn't do anything more than nurse, and cry and be cuddled. It wasn't as if they had been healed by Jesus or that others had witnessed the miracle, yet somehow what Simeon and Anna saw and believed about that little baby boy stuck in the minds of many and became a permanent part of his story. It's a big deal. And so it is that we take time with it today, asking why it mattered and what it showed them and us. So we start by asking, what did they see? What was visible to them from the very start? Simeon's first exclamation was, Lord, now I can die content, for I have seen him as you promised me I would. I have seen the Savior that you have given the world. He is the light and will shine upon the nations, and he will be the glory of your people Israel. Simeon saw something about Jesus, not because he was big and robust and able to lead the people. He saw something with divine clarity, something about who Jesus would become. It had to be God-given, since there's not much a baby can prove to us. And he knew and believed with certainty. Jesus was the Messiah, God's anointed one that he had been praying for. He was the one who would be the hope for Israel, but not just Israel, for all the world. I'm not sure I can fully express how powerful that could be for us. Just imagine a baby no more than a few weeks old. What can you discern or divine about that child? Not much. People will say, oh, she'll be smart. He'll be creative, right? But most of the time, we don't know that. We hope for it. We pray for it. But we don't really know any of it. And if someone told us that about a child, especially a baby, he's bound for greatness, the light of the world. What would we say? I'll believe it when I see it. We might shrug in half-hearted agreement or believe it because their parents are great, but to believe it with real conviction, it's not likely. Yet Simeon saw and knew and believed with full assurance. 
He could die in peace because he knew it would be true. Not right then, not any time even he would see, but he truly believed Jesus would be the one the Holy Spirit said that he would be. And it wasn't just something Simeon believed. Because of who Simeon was, because of his faithfulness, because people could respect who he was as a man of God, they believed it too. And maybe that's the more impressive part. In a world where we all want proof, Simeon's faith was contagious and enough for others to hold on to. But that wasn't the only word he had that day. There was more. He offered a blessing to Mary and Joseph and then told Mary, A sword shall pierce your soul, for this child shall be rejected by many in Israel, and this to their undoing. But he will be the greatest joy of many others, and the deepest thoughts of many hearts shall be revealed. In essence, this boy will become great. He'll become God's agent of salvation. That should give you great hope. Many will be saved by him. But remember this, with greatness comes great trials. While many will be saved, others will have their truth revealed, and it will be heartbreaking. Not exactly what you want to hear, especially as a new parent. But it's not really surprising either. People who do great things face great trials and often huge opposition. It would be no different for Jesus. And then Anna drew near, convicted about who Jesus was and maybe already about what Simeon had said, and she began to sing praises to God. She believed and trusted, and her first response was to praise God. She didn't lament the hardships that would come, but instead praised God for the hope and the light that was there before them. She knew it was good news, and people deserved to hear it. To be some of the first to see that boy before he became someone great, if they saw him, they would know and could celebrate that God had forecasted hope for all of Israel. So she told anybody that would listen. The extension that I draw is if we believe that Jesus is and can be all that God said he would be, we become the living witnesses for the power of God among us. So I ask, do you believe it? That Jesus saves us? That he is God's anointed one? That he is the light of the world? That he is the one that the Holy Spirit has testified to? That many will be saved by him and yet others will become known for who they really are? And if we believe it, are we sharing it as the good news for any and all to hear? And if we don't share it, who will be the messengers? Who would have to tell us those things in order for us to believe wholly and fully? Who are the faithful ones that you trust, that allow you to believe even that which stands outside of your own experience? And what might grow in us if we carried conviction into the new year? What if we didn't simply know it in our minds, but trusted it with our hearts, that Jesus is the Savior God sent to save the world, that he serves as a light to the world, those who believed before and those who would come to believe because of him? Let us pray. God, who is the loving parent, who shared your beloved son with us. We give you thanks for this great gift that you offer to the world. We give you thanks for the faithful who have borne witness, for Simeon and Anna, for Greg and Betty, for countless others that we name in our hearts and our minds. We ask that you would help us to cling to their witness and to be the proclaimers, the messengers here and now, today in this world. There is good news. There is hope. And we know it by the name Jesus, God's anointed one, the one who saves. In whose name we pray. Amen.